Topic Notes 14.1, Class Mammalia and Order Carnivora. We finally get to talk in depth about marine mammals, and we're going to start by just going over what is a marine mammal, and then Order Carnivora, which includes what this picture is. This, these are two sea lions, and this picture I took in the Galapagos Islands in San Cristobal, and it is not a trained behavior. These two just happened to do it. I caught it in a split second. It was really cute. All right, so the main ideas here today, first of all, mammals. What are they? Um, you are one, by the way. So <laughs> mammals are endothermic organisms with specialized characteristics that include mammary glands, hair, four-chambered heart, and a large cerebral cortex. Um, there's a couple more things too, but those are some biggies. Now the term marine mammals identifies specific mammalian species who depend on the marine environment for their survival. And also that marine mammals are diverse. They employ a wide variety of adaptations to live, feed, and reproduce in the marine environment. Once again, check out those learning goals and make sure you are up to date using your scales. So now let's go through the specific characteristics of class Mammalia. Now, first off, hair. Most people don't think about hair on a dolphin, but it's there. And if you look at that top left picture, that is of a dolphin rostrum. And you can see these little follicles along the rostrum. Dolphins, when they're born, have these little follicle hairs, and they help them actually find the mammary glands and actually nurse, which is kind of cool. Um, they usually lose them after that, and then they're relatively hairless. Other whales, like the right whale, um, which is uh, pictured on the top right, a very tip of it at least where the mouth is, you'll see like these little bristles coming out, kind of whisker-like hairs. That's hairs, and they keep that most of their lives. Uh, and manatees also have hair you can find. Mammals are endothermic, meaning they maintain that high temperature internally compared to the outside environment. And this, the same thing goes with us. You know, we're sitting here at around 98 point some odd degrees in our, um, in our bodies. Marine mammals are the same way, except they live in an aqueous environment where heat radiates away even faster. So they have to have enough food, enough metabolism, you know, a high enough metabolism to maintain that core temperature in the cold ocean. Now, remember, this also has to do with, uh, you know, energy within the trophic structure and the food web. Remember, when we lose energy as heat before it transfers, that, that energy is no longer available to the next trophic level. And we are little furnaces. We are Mammals are burning up all that energy, and it's radiating out away from us. Same thing with marine mammals as well. This is where a lot of that energy goes to, just out into the environment to maintain our temperature. Of course, uh, you know the term class mammalia comes from mammary glands. And of course, we do have mammary glands. Humans have them. Uh, all other mammals have them. On the bottom right, you'll see actually the mammary slits for a dolphin. And now if you've ever wanted to know the difference between a male and a female dolphin, uh, females have a division sign, which is what you're seeing there. And the mammary slits are on either side. And the males have an exclamation point. Mammals have specialized teeth for a variety of different things, whether it's catching animals and prey items or munching on vegetation. So they are very specialized that way. They have a four-chambered heart, and they have a large cerebral cortex, which generally is indicative of intelligence. And of course, uh, there's a lot of very smart mammals out there, probably none smarter than some of the toothed whales and dolphins that we're going to talk about. Now, when we look at the different types of mammals, I'm just going to mention this so we kind of get a feel for it. There's order monotremata, which are your duck-billed platypus. Uh, they are egg-laying mammals, so they're a little unusual, found in Australia. Then you have order marsupiella, and these are your marsupials. These are the pouch-rearing uh, animals, if you will, uh, kangaroos, wallabies, koalas, things like that. Opossums are also found in that as, as well, and they do exist here in the U.S. Of course, we're going to spend most of our time talking about placental mammals, because marine mammals are placental mammals, uh, and there are multiple orders of, of placental mammals, so I'm not going to get into that. And basically, the placenta is a membrane that transfers nutrients from the mother to the baby. They have live birth, that kind of thing. Um, you can see the images of a human and, and the diagram of a placenta with a little human inside it over on the right. Um, 
they generally will have a gestation period and a length of time in the uterus where they are utilizing that placenta and they are growing inside the mother. Again, things you already know about just from human biology. Okay, now let's get into the term marine mammals. Now, the, the actual term marine mammals is misconstrued a lot. Um, as we've talked about taxonomy, uh, what I want to make sure you understand is marine mammal is not a taxonomic term. It is not a phylogenetic term. It's just a characteristic about specific mammal groups that tend to spend the majority of their time or rely on the marine environment for their survival. And they do not have to be specifically evolutionarily linked. Now, that doesn't mean that some are not linked together uh, through phylogenetic classification, but they're not completely. For example, the polar bear on the right is not necessarily connected to uh, cetaceans like whales and dolphins or sirenians. Other than the fact that, of course, they're all mammals, so they are in some way related closer to each other than, let's say, an iguana. Now, tagging onto that, marine mammals, again, are polyphyletic groups. So there, there are several different uh, groups, and they evolve multiple times among different mammal groups. Um, so they, they didn't all just originate from one line. Generally, in the process of becoming a marine mammal, if you will, uh, they've evolved means to retain large quantities of oxygen to facilitate long dives. And a lot of this has to do with myoglobin storage as well. And we're going to get into that a little bit more later, but this is kind of big overarching sweeps. They also tend to have a very highly concentrated uh, urine, um, very highly saline, which makes sense because they're in a marine environment, a saltwater environment, and they have to get rid of this stuff somehow. And no, marine mammals don't generally drink the water. They actually get most of their water out of the food that they eat. Now let's get off to our first groups. Um, we're going to first talk about family Mustilidae, which includes sea otters. But I just want you to understand that there are other group animals within this group. This includes things like the weasel and the badger, and of course the river otter, which we do have here in Florida. Um, they all are very characterized by elongated bodies, short little legs, and short rostrums. Of course, we're going to primarily talk about sea otters. And sea otters we don't really actually have here in Florida, but they do exist on the west coast of the United States. They swim around by paddling their hind legs and sculling with their tails. And they can actually dive quite a lot, in fact, up to about 318 feet when foraging, which is pretty impressive. Interestingly enough, they are late to the game in terms of being a marine mammal. And because of that, they actually don't have a lot of the various uh, adaptations that you see in other groups. They don't have a blubber layer, for example. They rely on their dense fur. They have the, high, the highest density fur in the animal kingdom, and it traps air against their body, basically insulating them so that their skin doesn't get wet, so to speak. And it's like wearing a little dry suit, if you will, when they're in the water. Um, and they often have to groom and continually keep up this coat in order for it to actually work for them. But alongside of that, they have to maintain a relatively high metabolic rate compared to similar, similar animals on land. Uh, so they need a higher caloric intake to be able to maintain that temperature. It also doesn't help that they're one of the smaller marine mammals, so there's a lot of surface area for heat to radiate from. But they do pretty good. They spend a lot of their time hunting for little invertebrates, and interestingly enough, they use tools. They'll use rocks to help pry and shellfish apart and, and crack sea urchins open. And they're one of the most obvious and first documented uses of tools in the animal kingdom, aside from some of the primates. Now, in terms of mating, um, they, do your, they do mate year-round, but they actually undergo what we call delayed implantation, uh, where the embryo doesn't exactly implant into the uterus uh, until they're ready to start developing uh, the pup. 
and go through gestation. And so gestation takes about six to eight months, and they generally have about one pup at a time. Now, the reason why you do delayed implantation is simply because uh, you want to make sure you are having the pup at the right time of year where there's enough food, where the temperature is decent, the weather is decent to be able to have the pup and give it the best chance to survival. And that's why that happens. Now, going back to that really dense, nice fur, there was a fur trade in the 1700s and 1800s. And a lot of people and fur traders came to the West Coast of the U.S. to hunt and kill sea otters for their furs. And they would ship them back east, uh, and they were very fashionable at the time. I find it ironic at the time, a lot of the people that were wearing the furs probably didn't have never even seen a live sea otter. And of course, we don't have a great deal of data on what the uh, sea otter population was prior to these hunts, but there is estimated that over a million were killed and it really devastated the population. Not to mention, we realized that sea otters were a keystone species for the kelp forest ecosystem. And I've talked about this relationship before between uh, the sea otters preying upon the sea urchins, which maintain the urchin population, allowing the kelp to grow. As soon as you remove the sea otters, there were too many sea urchins, and all of a sudden the kelp forest became decimated by the urchins, and all the other species that relied on those kelp forests also became decimated. So it was a big, big deal. And, of course, even up till today, they are still threatened throughout the ma majority of the range, um, but their numbers are coming back, and the system is much healthier now. All right, now we're going to move on to polar bears, which is suborder uh, Physipedia, which is padded foot. Uh, and this has a couple of families. We're going to look at family Ursidae, which is the bears. There are five genres of bears, including black bears, brown bears, and polar bears. And these... Uh, are all related. However, polar bears um, did evolve and split from the brown bear ancestors probably around 200,000 years ago because they have very unique adaptations that make them a marine mammal compared to the others. And I love uh, the Inuit's uh, name for polar bears, which is Nanook, which means animal worthy of great respect. And I cannot ag agree more. Um, when you see these animals up close, they are very large, they're very powerful, and they are predators, serious predators. They range throughout the Arctic, and they hunt fish, seals, and even other marine mammals. In fact, you can do a quick YouTube search and probably find some relatively gruesome uh, footage of polar bears feeding. Uh, there's a, a bit of a gruesome picture on the bottom right there. Uh, and, you know, they, they are serious predators, uh, but they are incredibly cool and awesome uh, in terms of the, their adaptations, how they actually deal with the cold. Um, everything about them is just pretty cool. They are sex sexually dimorphic, which means the males are larger than the females. They get up to about 1,200 pounds. That's pretty significant. Um, they have their fur is actually really well designed for their environment. It is very thick and it has transparent hollow cores. So you're looking at a polar bear and you say, oh, that polar bear is white. The fur must be white. Well, the fur is not white. The fur is clear. The reason why you're seeing the white is because light is refracting within that uh, shaft that that hair shaft and it makes the appearance of the hair being white what's really going on is light energy from the sun is being channeled through that clear hair down to the skin which is actually black and remember if you've ever stepped on black asphalt in the middle of the day it's very hot black absorbs all of that thermal energy and that's what's happening on, on the skin of the polar bear. So the polar bear's skin is black with clear hair. On top of that, they have a very thick layer of blubber up to about four and a half inches. So these guys are really well designed for the cold. In fact, uh, as we've kept them in captivity from time to time, they have to be in a cold enough environment or they overheat very easily. 
Even their ears and tails are designed uh, for things because they are so uh, reduced. Now, polar bears are good swimmers. Um, we've tracked them up to about 62 miles of swimming. Um, they might be able to do more, um, but they are not the greatest at diving and holding their breath. They can stay down for about two minutes and they uh, really only dive to about 20 feet. So these guys are not deep uh, divers. They're gonna stay at the surface. Their paws are really designed for the ice. Their paws actually at the bottom of them have these what we call palpulae uh, that help to grip the ice, which make it really uh, stable for them. They're also very big paws that help spread their weight out, especially in ice that might be thinner. Now the females breed about every three years and they typically have up to about two cubs, sometimes three on the off uh, chance. Um, nursing will continue for about two and a half years. And at that point, the uh, female is pretty much ready to breed again. And a male will generally come along. And at that point, uh, the cub is generally uh, kind of chased off either by the female herself or uh, her particular pursuing uh, males. And at that point, the cub is on their own. Interestingly enough, uh, polar bears go through what we call induced ovulation, meaning that the act of uh, copulation or sex uh, causes co uh, ovulation to occur. So basically, they have to continue to copulate over and over again in order for her to actually uh, go through the process of getting pregnant. And of course, the sad note of this is that uh, polar bears are really reliant on sea ice. Um, they live in the Arctic. Uh, they use the sea ice to get around from one area to the next. Um, they cannot swim forever. Uh, and this is becoming a big issue because through climate change, as sea ice is actually decreasing, their habitat is decreasing. It is estimated that about two thirds of all polar bears will be gone by 2050, possibly more. The, the estimates just keep flexing on this. Uh, and there is a serious possibility that we will lose polar bears in the wild, possibly during your own lifetime. All right, now we're going to turn to suborder Penipedia, or the feather-footed. And these uh, are probably your most familiar, you're talking about your seals and sea lions. Um, they are generally very highly specialized aquatic carnivores. They do need to return to the land or ice to bear their pups. They generally have about one pup uh, per year. Um, they have both fur and blubber that help them in thermoregulation. Uh, they also, that blubber provides uh, food reserves as well, especially when they uh, maybe can't find food, and helps them with buoyancy as well. They have two sets of flippers, both the fore flippers and hind flippers. Uh, they differ between seals and sea lions, which we'll get to. They have long whiskers, nasal openings at the, nasal openings at the tip of their snout, reduced ear flaps, uh, or lost them completely, it depends on the species, and they molt yearly, meaning that they shed all of their fur uh, and actually regrow. So just a few notes about diving adaptations, and this is very much repetitive throughout a lot of these marine mammal groups. Um, they have a high blood to body ratio, meaning that they have a lot of blood in their bodies compared to their size, and uh, a lot of a high concentration of red blood cells. This concentration of hemoglobin and myoglobin, uh, if you don't remember from biology, myoglobin tends to be in your muscles, um, that high concentration allows them to store a lot of oxygen to allow them to dive. And if you look over on the right, you'll see uh, a, a graph that's explaining this. It gives you three examples, a human, uh, a stellar sea lion, and an elephant seal. And you can see uh, the basically milligrams per kilogram of oxygen in each of these groups, in the blood, lungs, and the muscles. And you can see elephant seals outwin at all. They happen to be one of the deeper divers around. We've actually tracked them to over 5,000 feet. That's incredible. Now, I happened to be driving along the coast of California a few years back, and I actually found a uh, molting, uh, basically, group of elephant seals. These are all male, male elephant seals. And they come up in the summer 
uh, and get onto these beaches and basically rub around and get rid of all their fur. Uh, and when they do so, they look a little ragged. Uh, and they kind of vie for some territory here and there. You see them kind of fluffing around with each other, but uh, they're really not too serious because there's no females around. Hopefully you hear a little bit of that vocalization. You can imagine what they're like when they really get into it. And of course, this is a perfect time to actually go into uh, seals in general. We're going to go into family uh, Phocidae, which are our seals. Uh, and their characteristics, as you can probably see from the videos before, uh, is that they don't have external ears, so they completely lack them. They have short forelimbs that they don't really use for swimming so much, more for steering, and they do have claws on them. Um, but their, their rear flippers can't really rotate forward for them to stand. And if you noticed the video before with the elephant seals, they're kind of slinking around on their bellies. Um, the same thing happens with all these other seals. And in fact, you can see uh, down there in the middle is the Hawaiian monk seal. And yes, it is actually the only uh, kind of tropical seal that we have left. There actually used to be a Caribbean monk seal. However, it was hunted to complete extinction. There is no longer any seals in the Caribbean. Now, most of these guys will feed on squid, crustaceans, mollusks, fish, all sorts of different things. And on average, you can get a good dive time of around 35 minutes. Like I said, the elephant seal is sort of the exception. They go very much deeper and farther than everybody else. Um, so it's really difficult to give you specifics on all of these different groups. There are harbor seals up on the top right, and of course the little harp seal pup that's just so cute. Then we've got our sea lions, family Odoriidae. And the sea lions are probably the most charismatic, um, well-known because they're in a lot of the marine parks and whatnot and shows. Um, they're very... Uh, you know, very charismatic. Um, they have a small cartilaginous external ear, so that makes a very big difference compared to seals that don't have any. Um, so a little small flap. And they do have a distinctive little tail, actually, if you look at them. Their forelimbs uh, are very much longer and paddle-like, and they can rotate up under them so that they can walk around on land using them. And that actually makes a huge difference. So unlike seals, which have to slink on their bellies, these guys can walk around a little bit better. Generally, also, they swim with those forelimbs and use their hind limbs, hind limbs more for rudders and steering. They feed on everything from fish, selfish, cephalopods, all sorts of things, and their dive time much shorter than seals, between 5 to 10 minutes. Now we get into family Odobinidae. This is your walruses. And these guys, of course, are very distinctive from the other groups. They have those long external tusks. Interestingly enough, both sexes actually have them. They use them for all sorts of things. They can be for combat, for display, which is most likely. Um, they can use them for anchorage and ice, and they can use them for foraging. And you can see the picture on the bottom is actually a um, walrus foraging through the muck, looking for various shellfish to be able to eat. They are sexually dimorphic, so they have both uh, different sizes, really, with their, their sexes. And males get much larger. They have very thick blubber, and they don't really have much fur on them compared to considering you know, seals and sea lions that have fur all over them. They do have their whiskers and things like that, so they are mammals, but they don't have that fur coat everywhere. Um, they do not have any external ear appendages either, so there's that as well. Now, for these guys, when they're swimming, their hind legs provide the most of the propulsion, uh, aided by foreign limbs, so they sort of use both. Uh, and they feed on benthic invertebrates, they like clams specifically. And they can dive up to about 30 minutes looking for this stuff. And their foraging grounds are oftentimes relatively way out at sea. And they rely on sea ice to be able to access those areas because they need to be able to land themselves somewhere, whether it's on land or ice, for periods of time. And as 
climate change is affecting the amount of sea ice out there, that's actually having a big impact on where walruses go to feed. And it's causing some disruptions. And there's a video I'm going to show you guys about this generally in class, um, which is very interesting. So um, both polar bears and walruses are having big issues with climate change, especially with the reduction of sea ice. Now it's time to throw it back to you. Considering the major threat to polar bears and walruses have to do with reduction of Arctic sea ice, what steps can be taken on a local and a global level to help? So I'll let you think about that. And of course, until next time, keep thinking.